was um, harvested millet last September, and then it just laid fallow all winter, millet stubble. And then in March, I came in here with the cover crop. My intention was to plant this field back to wheat. And I sprayed, I planted that cover crop in March and I terminated by chemically spraying it in um, middle of June. The RMA told me if I terminated it 90 days before I was intended to plant wheat, I could still insure it as summer fallow practice. Well, a week after I sprayed it, insurance agent called and said, no, it's a continuous crop. They changed it. So I said, screw you guys. I came <laughs> back here and I, I plant another cover crop. So now it's obviously not going back to weed, it'll go back to a, a spring crop. But this was planted around July 15th. What did you put in here? It's sorghum sedan, um, sunflowers, buckwheat, safflower, nitro radish, rapeseed, kale, cowpeas, uh, there's some guar, winter oats, winter barley, there's some German millet out there. Sun hemp. Sun hemp. And there's, some, there's a marigold actually right there. I threw some flower mix in. Hmm. Yeah, there's thir <laughs> 13 different species. What is it? And, it's uh, deeper in there. Did the guac come up? Yeah. yeah I can't find any of the legumes oh, anymore. Okay. That after it froze, they kind of oh. disintegrated. Huh. They all as a really, really fine leaf coming out of the tree that's growing. So these sunflowers have got a really good reputation for helping to build soil. I'm not quite sure, no one's really quite sure what it is. I guess those roots have pushed down through what would have been pretty hard blocky stuff there. Uh -huh. So wherever they've gone through, they'll be, um, yeah, improving the biological activity in that soil. So the other thing um, for the people that were at the pre where we were previously, and I was talking about the riser sheaths on the roots, they only form on the newly growing roots, so they were young plants and we saw them near the surface. If you wanted to look for biological activity in, in something like this that was mature, you're going to have to look wherever, you know, down here somewhere. Wherever that root goes, it'll be happening down at the end of that root. So that roots don't exude material from these older, more mature sections. They only exude it where they're actively growing. So that with something like, just to get off this topic altogether and talk about um, the previous place we were was moving towards a rotational grazing system. With a pulse grazing system, if the forage is allowed to grow and then grazed in a short grazing event and then allowed to rest again so that it can recover its photosynthetic capacity and then grazed again in a short high intensity grazing event, what will happen in that event is that a lot of roots will be prune into the soil to equalise the biomass and then it grows new roots and it's the growing of the new roots that that have the biological activity that's like if you just leave a plant like we were just talking about the CRPs they're not grazed for 10 years or something well everything just is going to run down there you need like grazing is a stimulus provided it's um they're, they're grazed appropriately so what we're seeing now compared to the field that we were in before with the cover crop that was only young and we saw the riser sheaths and everything, you're not going to see them, you, as I said, you're not going to see them all around these old roots. Okay, so, so these roots have, will have changed the biology in that soil as they pass through that soil, and they'll be, however deep they went, they'll be changing the biology further down. Someone also asked whether, um, whether your brassicas will form mycorrhizal relationships, so I'm assuming that everyone knows mycorrhizal fungi form symbiotic relationships with about 80% of flowering plants, not including brassicas. But if these are growing in a community with other plants, they will link up to the mycorrhizal network. So all of the plants here are joined together through networks of mycorrhizal fungi. They communicate with each other, they swap nutrients, and they, the mycorrhizal fungi are also important for bringing water back to the plants. These guys aren't mycorrhizal, but, um, but they will link into the mycorrhizal network. So they're not anti-mycorrhizal, put it that way. Um, but if you have like just a monoculture of some kind of brassica like canola, um, beets aren't mycorrhizal either. So if you just have just that one species that's not forming mycorrhizal relationships and hasn't got other plants in the community to link to, then over time that soil 
um, will become very low in mycorrhizal activity and mycorrhizal fungi are really important for transporting nutrients in soil, transporting water in soil and improving soil structure. So it's great to see a community of plants like this. Are there a species that are more adapted to mycorrhizal? Well, these sunflowers are highly, highly, uh, uh, what's the word for it? Attractive. They can actually improve your mycorrhizal colonisation, like the number of spores that you've got in soil. Sunflowers are, are great for that. Um, obviously these guys won't improve mycorrhizae, it's just that I'm saying if they're in mixtures they won't inhibit it either. So it and can be used by plants and it can be used to grow more plants. So you can actually produce more biomass by having your water down there. And water on the surface is not going to be much use to you. Right. So by having, by having cover crops which yes initially may use a bit of water, over time they're going to improve the way that water infiltrates. It's going to infiltrate deeper into the soil and be held better because when your soil down deep is like all these little aggregates like this, the water that goes inside those aggregates is protected as well. So your soil will infiltrate water faster and better and deeper and hold it for longer and you over time will grow much better and better crops. Okay. So the bacteria that fix in need energy and they get it from the sun. The plant is the conduit for that sunlight energy, transforming light energy to biochemical energy in the form of sugar and trans emitting it through the plant. If we supply in, the plant doesn't need in, so it doesn't photosynthesize at a high rate. So if you had a, in a fertilized field, your wheat, for example, would be brixing at about two or three units. It's just on the, on the scale, on the refractometer. In a biological system, like say following a cover crop or in a pasture crop system, or maybe in a compost system, they might be brixing up around 20, which means the plant's photosynthesizing at a much, much higher rate. It'll still look the same, they're the same height. You can't tell by looking at it how fast it's photosynthesizing, but you can manage, you can measure the brix level. And if the brix is high, uh, anything over 12, they say it can't get, can't be attacked by insects. Um, that seems to be common knowledge. There's no research papers on that, but that's what people generally say. If the brix level's above 12, it can't be attacked by aphids or anything. It won't get rust. Make get root rots. I mean, there's just a whole lot of things that go. You need a refractometer. You need a refractometer. <laughs> they come back. They see tissue tests come back with virtually no nitrate, and they go, "You're not going to get a grain. You're not going to get grain yield. This is in a biological system, right? You're not going to get any grain." And then the, the guys that they've set it to are getting the highest grain yields and the highest quality in the state. So they say, "Well, how does that work?" They say, "Well, you don't need nitrate. You don't need nitrate in the system. There's actually heaps of nitrogen there." But it's total, it's like amino acids, it's proteins, you know, it's in an organic form rather than an inorganic form. So it's so hung up on nitrate that even your tissue test will come back having measured nitrate in the leaves. So all you want to know is how much total N is in there, how much total N is in your soil, how much total N is in the leaves if you, want to, if you do want to know. But yeah, measure bricks and see. Now the only thing with bricks, obviously, it's measuring photosynthesis, so it's going to be different in the morning to what it is in the afternoon, etc., etc. So you have to be able to calibrate that to, so that you know you've done it at the same time every day and that sort of thing. You know, with um, why spray it out? Like what it would cost you to to drive over that land and spray it? You could drive over that land and plant something else into it to make it more diverse. Why not put some? Um, you know, some peas and some vetch and some other things in with the volunteer wheat and just improve the diversity of it instead of spraying it out. Mm -hmm. you know, and make it you. into its a ready-made cup. I'll tell you what the producer's side of it is, is that volunteer weed is a vector for uh, the mice that gives you the next disease. The yeah, and if you raise your bricks above 12? <coughs> I'm with you. You're speaking to the <laughs> choir. I'm all about is, the refractometer is, now. <laughs> you know, how does something you know, if this is the soil surface, how does something down here know what time of the year it is, whether it's night or day, or whether a plant's living or dying, or whatever? Life in the soil is totally dependent on chemical signals or other kinds of signals um, from plants and, and whatever. And if you've got microbes living in association with plants, they know, if microbes can know, what stage of development the plant is. For example, mycorrhizal fungi. Uh, will produce spores when the plant is shutting down because they need to have those, those spores need to be in the soil for like say your winter period when there's nothing growing there, that those spores will germinate again in the following spring and re, uh, reform those relationships with the growing, newly growing plants.
because mycorrhizal fungi can only survive on energy from a living plant. There's no other energy source that they can use. When there's no living plants here, there won't be any mycorrhizal fungi, but there will be spores in the soil so that they can germinate again when there are living plants here. That's how they, uh, that's how they maintain a presence in the soil from one generation of plants to the next. Now, if you had a, um, like what you had before when you sprayed out your, your cover crop, when it was still in an actively growing stage, mycorrhizal fungi, you know, didn't know that was going to happen because one day they've, they're, those plants were photosynthesizing and channeling lots of carbon to the soil, mycorrhizal fungi going, oh wow, you know, this is great. The next day you come and spray them and that's all over Red Rover and they haven't produced very many spores. So they're always producing some spores but not very many. Now with this one, these plants, when they start to shut down, mycorrhizal fungi get that signal that the amount of photosynthate being channeled to the soil is diminishing. So we're coming into a period of non-plant growth. We need to produce lots of spores so that we can still be here. I mean, obviously they don't think, but you know what I mean. Mm -hmm. It's like it's, it's an evolutionary thing or it's a, it's a natural thing. That's for sure. But if you wanted to maximise biological activity, it's better to let the plants go through to at least a certain stage of maturity. Magnificent beaches around the Australian coastline. I don't know whether anyone's been there, but it's one of our, our positives is that we have these beautiful sandy beaches and behind the beaches there's sand dunes that have got plants on them that always used to amaze me that the plants were always green never ever water stressed and you know they were growing in meters and meters of sand you think where do they get the water where do they get the nutrients how can they grow so well in this in pure sand and then they started dredging some of the entrances to our harbors and some of the estuaries that were getting silted up because people were losing soil from the land and it was silting up our rivers and they dredge sand out that had been underwater for maybe you know years and just make big piles of it and then plant the same kinds of things that were growing in the sand dunes just plant them in the sand dunes and they'd all die and everyone's going this is really weird you know they're the same plants they grow beautifully in sand we put them in a we make this nice sand dune for them and plant them all in there <laughs> water them you know and they die and then they realized it was because what they needed to do was just go and get some sand from one of the sand dunes that had these plants growing just a little bit like a handful under under each plant that they put in and they grew perfectly because what are they doing inoculating it with mostly mycorrhizal fungi that are actually in that sand um, so you know as I said you'll never see a nitrogen deficient plant or what it, in a natural ecosystem because all the microbes that they need will be there and that's what supports them in you know how do plants grow in deserts and places like that I know they don't grow very fast you won't see a nitrogen deficient plant in the desert. Um, and the, and the, a lot of them get their water through mycorrhizal networks and, and those kinds of things. So we, we think in agriculture that all we need to do is do some variety selection and get a better variety of something and put the right amount of fertiliser on and cultivate the, or whatever we're going to do to the soil to get a nice seed bed or, you know, whatever. We think that the agronomy, it's all about the agronomy, it's not. It's all about the biology, it's all about the microbes.